Um, thank you for coming here today for the ECECSA academic seminar. The speaker today is Yen Chan Lin. Uh, he's from Taiwan. He got his bachelor degree in physics in 20, uh, 2003 from National Taiwan University. And uh, his, uh, he got his uh, PhD in uh, 2011 from the University of Minnesota, working on superconducting thin films. Is that correct? Yes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, after a very successful graduate career, he uh, was offered a postdoc position from the University of uh, Michigan. And there he uh, worked on um, thermal electric material, which he will talk about today. And uh, from now on, he will uh, work at the University of Maryland. So thank you. Okay, I would like you. All right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, my name is Yen Shang Lin. So, I'm from the physics department. And I just joined the physics department in like a few months ago. So, I, would, I wouldn't be able to present any work here because uh, oh, we have an empty lab right now and we just started to building a big thing. So, um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the work that I did in my previous postdoc, which is in Michigan, and it's related to nanostructured uh, uh, thermoelectric material. And we just developed a new method to characterize uh, uh, those, uh, those uh, thermoelectric material, which is called scanning thermoelectric microscopy. And so we'll talk about that uh, later today. Um, so before I start the talk, uh, I want to uh, give thanks to all the uh, all, all, all of my friends in my, in my previous group in, uh, in Michigan and then also a lot of cooperation from other groups in Michigan. Uh, I want to especially uh, give thanks to Jenna I mean, who is working close with me and then uh, did a lot of uh, work uh, on, on, on the things that I'll present today. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people, uh, Yu Wei, Wei and uh, Hong they, they, and Vladimir, they provide a whole bunch of different samples for us to, to, to play with. Okay, so before I start, let me just uh, ask one, one question. So, because um, this, is related to, uh, th this is related to the efficiency of uh, using, using energy today. So let's say you, you, you spend $50 buying gas and then to, uh, uh, for, for, for your car, and then how much do you think it has been used to really move your car? Um, more C or D? C or D? D. 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 Oh, you guys are smart, so <laughs> you guys are pretty have a pretty good sense. <laughs> so it's only like a five to fifteen dollars is really used to move your car. So the efficiency is about only twenty percent. So and then and then lots of like a oh, more than twenty percent or more than sixty percent is like a big waste of. And then there are definitely there are some, some energy that's being used for you. for cooling your car, for example, you provide the air condition energy for the air condition. But only 20% have been used for your car. So among your waste energy, actually, so I, I show here a picture of a working uh, working engine uh, and then and then all the way to the exhaust to the to the muffler here, as you can see that it's a lot of heat. And then the temperature for the highest one, as you can see here, it could be as high as 800 Celsius. And then even go to uh, the muffler, it can be also still around like 100 Celsius. So there's a lot of heat have been wasted, and then more than 50% is like being wasted in, in, in the heat. Flow. So let's say, okay, 50% 50, 50 of the heat has become waste heat. If we can recover just some of that, let's say 10%. So 10% of it, this 50% uh, waste energy is 5%. So you can change the usable energy from 20% to 25%. That's a, that's a pretty good improvement. And actually that can be achieved right now. And if we can go a little bit higher, then I mean, you, can, you can think about like your MPG is, can, could, could be presumably double or something like that. <coughs> so so the, the next question is, is there any way that we can recover those uh, uh, wasted heat, and the answer is yes. And there is a there is a long existing work. Well, there's a, uh, a there's a, a phenomenon which is which is called a thermoelectric effect that been discovered long ago. 
um, from 18, about 18. So um, one is called like Seabag effect. The Seabag effect is kind of like this. If you if you put some kind of material, um, and uh, it could be metal, it could, and most of them could uh, this uh, semiconductor, and then you provide a different uh, temperature gradient from uh, of of this material, and then actually the temperature, yeah, the temperature gradient um, can drive uh, your carrier from one side to the other side, and then so if you put like for example here you put n-type material, the other side you put p-type material, you can drive uh, the carrier from high temperature to low temperature, and then actually you can drive a curve. So then, um, for example, if you heated it, then you drive the carrier, then you can generate some, uh, you can generate some electricity. And actually this, this process can be reversed. So which is, if you, if you put a, if you, if you use this material, and you put a battery or provide a current, actually those, uh, the current that they flow, you can carry the heat from one side to the other side. Then actually you can generate, uh, you, can, you can make it become like a one side cold, the other side is hot. So actually, um, I, bring, I bring one of this uh, thermoelectric material here today. As you can see, this is, this is a thermoelectric uh, uh, module that you can, you can easily buy on our on, on, on website. And then here I hook up to the voltage meter. So what I need to do is I, I just uh, generate a temperature gradient from uh, from the two from two out, uh, from uh, uh, like across uh, across this. So let's say let me just heat it up. As you can see, the number is still going up. So it should generate some kind of um, um, uh, um, voltage here. And actually, you see it was like a negative sign. But if you generate the heat to the opposite sign, then it will become positive. So, like uh, the voltage that you generate is related, strongly related to the uh, to the temperature gradient uh, direction. And the other thing is like uh, you can, uh, you guys can play with it. It's like you hook up to a battery, then actually you can see the this uh, potier cool, cooler effect that uh, you you feel like on one side it's cold, the other side is hot. So if we, and you guys can just hook up to the battery and you guys can feel it. And um, it can become really, really hot, so be careful. So, so what you can do is that you can hold it, and then and maybe other people can help. So you, can, you guys can, you guys, you guys can feel it. All right. So this thermoelectric effect is uh, one of the key that you can like uh, recover some waste of the heat, or you can use it to generate some kind of cooler. Yeah. So actually, th this has been used uh, in, in in some of uh, in, uh, the, the, there are, there's already some some kind of application. And as you can see, that because this this uh, thermal module is uh, this thermal module is kind of like a, there's no moving part. You just only have a semiconductor over there, and then it's quiet. So it's not like a, the daily the the, the the fridge that you use in your house. You need a compressor and then you generate noise. So um, first of all, and then it's kind of light. It can be small. It can be compact. So you can this, there's already like a being used in like a picnic thermal electric fridge that you can bring and then you can charge it with your car and then <coughs> become a really small uh, refrigerator. And then there's another thing is like a. Um, this kind of it, it become a generator. It, it, you can use it as a generator, and this has been used for like a NASA deep uh, space probe. So, if you, if you guys think about it, like if you go to like really far away from from, from the sun, then your solar cell won't work, right? Because um, the energy that you can receive from solar is really, really low, and so then and then and then because those uh, those uh, 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 space ships, they're really really compact. You cannot. You cannot bring like a, a giant generator. So how did they how did they generate energy for them to use? So the answer is what they do is they put they use some kind of a, a, like a nuclear isotope and then they will decay and that kind of decay kind of generates some heat and they put uh, those uh, thermoelectric material to convert those heat to become electricity. So and then you can you can make a a, a generator in a very like a compact volume. So this has been used 
for actually more than 40 years. And for example, like the curiosity, the 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 uh, the the, um, the exploring machine that on Mars right now, actually, it is also using this kind of uh, isotope uh, uh, thermoelectric to help the solar cell system for for, for for it to work. And actually, there's already um, some kind of uh, this kind of uh, waste heat recovery uh, being developed in in uh, General Motors uh, car. And then there's another application so it's, it has been used in, in kind of a Navy, Navy ship because it's quiet and there's no moving part. You can imagine that um, and if you use this as your generator, actually you can, you can first of all, you can save a lot of energy and then second, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quiet, so your ship won't be detected by sonar. So, so, that's, uh, so, so uh, it has been, been used. But actually, if you think about it, um, there isn't too much application in your daily life, right? I mean, you, you haven't seen like, this kind of thermal electric material a lot in your daily life. The reason is um, there's uh, several uh, problems uh, for you to really bring into application. So there are uh, lots of uh, material challenge. First is the cost, because you want to make uh, those materials, some of them are like a high cost. And then some of them are really toxic. For example, one, one kind of uh, thermal electric material, good thermal electric material is lead tellurite, so you need to use lead, which is toxic. Uh, people don't like it. And the most important uh, factor, limiting factor, is the efficiency. So the efficiency is actually is kind of low, and actually it will relate it to uh, a lot of uh, parameter of, the, of your material, and which I will talk about in the next, next few slides. And then so, Actually, because those um, those uh, parameters are kind of like uh, related to each other, if you want to tune one, the other also will change. And then actually, it's really hard to make a good thermoelectric material with a high efficiency. And actually, you you would think, uh, uh, I just want to like, if I just like hiring like a uh, um, make um, if if I just want the, like a, a Reduce uh, or change one of the parameter. Actually, you uh, you also change all the others. So it's hard. Okay. So um, so I'm I'm coming from physics department, and I've been told that uh, there should uh, contain at least the one equation in your in your talk. So this is the only uh, slides that contain equation in my in my talk, and it looks like complicated, but uh, actually um, let me just walk you through. So this is uh, demonstrating. Uh, 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 like a, 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 a device that uh, converting heat to electricity, and actually, then you will have some kind of efficiency, right? And then the optimal efficiency will be kind of like this factor, which is your Carnot efficiency, which is the optimal, the the greatest uh, efficient efficiency that you can you can obtain um, according to. Uh, uh, thermodynamic law, and then it, it, it will times some kind of factor, and that and inside that factor, there's a one factor actually is uh, strongly related to to the to the uh, material parameter, which is this z, and then actually we call it zt because it's a dimensionless um, a dimensionless uh, 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 quantity, and this is a figure of merit of uh, of your material uh, for uh, thermoelectric conversion. And this uh, Z actually contains three, three parameter. One is S, which is your C-back coefficient. Uh, the other two is uh, the, thermal, the, uh, the sigma, which is the electrical conductivity. And then the third one is the kappa, kappa which is the, the thermal, thermal conductivity. So, I mean, this, this makes sense. Uh, if you want to make a good thermal electric, uh, uh, like, like the efficiency really high, first of all, you want to have a, if you put, you want your CPAC coefficient is really as high as possible because you want to have generate a large voltage, right? And if you just apply, a, uh, just apply the temperature gradient to that. So this, this is really, this is uh, enhance of, uh, you want to S, maximize the, the S. And then you want to, this sigma is, is also as good as possible. So actually that is because when you really running, make it a generator, you have current actually running through all your devices. So if, you, if the electrical conductivity is bad, then actually you, you're consuming a lot of energy inside your device. So you can't really use it. And then the third one is uh, you want to have uh, your thermal conductivity as low as possible. 
because if you want to maintain like uh, the if you have a if the thermal conductivity is too good, actually you cannot maintain the temperature gradient between these two because then the, your material your device will just conducting heat from one side to the other side, and at the end these two temperature will will, will become equilibrium, and then you cannot generate generate any electricity. So you you want to de you want you want to maximize your S, you want to maximize your your uh, electrical conductivity, and then you want to minimize your uh, thermal conductivity. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think here. Uh, isn't sigma by kappa just via wiedermann franz law? Exactly. The uh, Lorentz number times temperature. Yeah. And so uh, you're kind of that's kind of a constant <coughs> times temperature. So how yeah. did those material parameters really play anyway? Yeah. So so actually, this is exactly the point. So it's so hard. I mean, sigma divided by k actually it's been limited. It's it's like especially in in, in metal, it's a constant. You, you cannot change it. So you can, you, if you want to maximize your sigma, actually you also also your your capital will also also increase. So it's so hard to change it. And so in the next slide that that here I just show of uh, like uh, the trade off between S sigma and capital. Okay. So we want to maximize the the, the setback coefficient. So one way to maximize it or to change it is by, by changing the carrier concentration. So actually, in metal, the thermoelectric effect is really low. It's because the, the carrier concentration is so, it's so, it, it's so high. And then so this uh, setback co uh, sit coefficient is really, really low. But uh, in, in, that, in that case, you can get very good uh, electrical conductivity. Um, but uh, but because the setback coefficient is low, actually it's not good for thermal electric uh, application. And for insulator, it's in, it's on the on the other limit. You have very high setback coefficient, but uh, the electrical conductivity is really really low. So you cannot you cannot use it as your uh, good. Uh, uh, you, you, it's not a good uh, uh, a thermal electric uh, uh, device. And so. You, you, you kind of have a trade-off between S and sigma. So the optimal uh, case is happening inside the inside the uh, inside the uh, semiconductor for this S squared uh, for this S squared times uh, sigma. So and then this actually happened when your Fermi L energy is aligning with the with the bottom of your conduction band or aligning with the top of your uh, a valence band. Okay. And then the other thing is like a, a, your kappa. Okay, so actually, I mean, the question is already raised over there that uh, we cannot do anything with this uh, cap. Uh, so your cap is thermal, uh, thermal conductivity. So it contains actually two parts. One is uh, the thermal conductivity due to the, trickle con uh, the electron conduction. The other is uh, due to the lattice conduction. And actually, we, we can do almost nothing with your uh, uh, electrical conduct uh, electron conduction because, uh, because it's like a strongly tied it with the with your with your signal, right? and and so actually people people only people can do is uh, reduce this uh, lattice uh, uh, thermal conductivity in order to get a better uh, thermal electric device. So actually, you, you already see that this this problem is hard. If you tune some some kind of if if you tune some kind of parameter, for example, the one that you can tune is the carrier concentration. All these parameters will change with your parameter, and then. You need to find the optimal of that, which is pretty hard. And so here I'm just showing that actually all the thermal, uh, uh, the thermal electric material that we use in, in these days actually doesn't have a very good ZT right now. The ZT that we have, um, um, right, uh, the one that I, I just showed you, that one, is probably just having some ZT around one. And if you want to really make it to a good, uh, and actually, it's 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 uh, like the corresponding to the energy conversion efficiency is only about five percent. And if you want to you, you, like make it as good as uh, like uh, for example the, the CSU that actually is the fridge that you use in your house, um, you need to you need to have ZT that larger than three, and which is uh, which is pretty difficult. Okay, is there so next question is is there any chance that uh, we find some kind of handle or like to to help us? To like uh, overcome this kind of trade-off, so 
actually the nanostructure material uh, holds, the, holds the key to, to solve this, uh, to, in, to enhance the ZT problem. So there are several proposals that the nanotechnology can help this. One is, uh, one is uh, using, because of uh, quantum confinement, your density of states will change with, uh, with, uh, with the dimension. So for example, in bulk material, your bed structure will be like a single, will, will be like a parabolic like. But if you have like, a, for example, um, a thin film or, a con or like a nanowire or quantum dot, their, their uh, density of states will become, will become step-like or this kind of uh, spiky shape or this delta function. And actually, if you can, uh, people propose that if you can align uh, your uh, Fermi energy around these kind of uh, anomaly inside the, inside the density of states, you can enhance the seatback coefficient as much uh, uh, a lot without uh, without without uh, reduce the uh, re without reduce the um, uh, electrical conductivities. Another proposal is like because of uh, those nano material. So inside the material, there's a lot of interface. And those interface will scatter phono, and then so that you can reduce. Actually, you can reduce uh, the uh, the phono uh, transport, which is the lattice uh, thermal conductivity. And then, but for the electron, uh, it, it it still conduct. So this is the proposal that we can reduce kappa, but uh, you maintain your your signal, which is the electrical conductivity. So they have been proposed like that, but. Uh, so, and then people working on that, and actually there's already some, some improvement that people found that with this nano, nano structure material, you can enhance the ZT up to two to three, um, near, nearly three, not, not exactly three. But there's a problem for, for those uh, nano material because it's really difficult to characterize those uh, parameters inside the nano structure. For example, if you grow like quantum dots inside inside material and you want to measure the setback coefficient, then in the traditional way, what you do is to just patterns on the electrodes, and then you measure, you, you give it a temperature gradient, and then you measure the voltage across these two electrodes. The problem is the Sibac coefficient that you measure actually is the average of uh, your whole sample. So the Sibac coefficient that you measure is containing those nanostructure and then also all the background. And actually, then you don't know, and then actually it's really hard to know what's happening because you're not specifically measuring the nanostructure, you're measuring them. And then it's, uh, it's most likely it's been smeared out. So, so for, for, for a long time, actually, uh, people are struggling uh, to characterize the, uh, the setback the coefficient um, in nanostructure. And then also, also um, because we cannot like, uh, precisely uh, uh, measure S, so people really don't understand that. Like, uh, how does uh, how does it, how in, in experimentally how does the Sibac coefficient being uh, uh, like being affected by by the like quantum confinement? Okay, so all the all, all the previous slides is just showing the theoretical prediction, but experimentally it's really hard to do. So so what I what we did uh, in my previous group we we proposed actually this has been proposed uh, like uh, um, ten years ago, and then there's uh, some preliminary experiment. And then we, we, we keep doing on this a new a new technology to probe the seaback coefficients of a nanostructure material. So what we did is uh, using a S STM, which is a scanning tunneling microscopy, and what you have is a metal tip, and that tip uh, is very sharp. At the end of the tip, it can be like a uh, it can be like atomically sharp. And so what we do is like you heat up the sample, and then you make uh, your tip. Contact it to your sample. So at that, and then because you heat up your sample, and then your tip we maintain it at the room temperature when you contact it. Around the contact, you have to generate a nano contact, and then and then you you cooling down your sample. So you generate some kind of temperature gradient inside your sample. And this range actually is only a few nanometers, depends on your uh, formal mean phase path of your of your sample. And so and then actually because uh, there's a temperature gradient. Uh, and due to Sibat effect, you can, you can generate some kind of voltage. So then what we do is you just measure that voltage, then you can get the Sibat coefficient of a, of a nanometer range. So this is a method that you can really um, do, you can, you can have a really like a nanometer resolution of a Sibat coefficient. 
So this is a real, uh, some kind of a real uh, a picture that we have. We have a very sharp tip right here, and then we can contact our sample. So this sample order is uh, bearing with a lot of heater and also thermometer inside to characterize the temperature and then, and then heating of the sample, and then we contact it. So let me just show one of the one, one of the, the, the result that we measure. So we measure uh, pN junction uh, across, uh, well, we measure the, the Seebeck coefficient across a pN junction. So this is a, a gallium arsenide a pN junction, so one side is doped with the silicon, which is n type, the other side is uh, p type. And then the Seebeck coefficient is uh, related to your carrier type. If it is positive, or if it is p type, your Seebeck coefficient will be positive. If it is uh, n type, your Seebeck coefficient will be negative. And then so the voltage that you generate will change some across the pN junction. And so here's the result. The voltage we measure across this pN junction. And then this line is the theoretical, uh, theoretical prediction of the voltage that we, should, that we should measure. And as you can see that uh, across, so, so what we do is use STM to identify this, uh, PN, uh, this pN junction first. And then we just measure uh, this, uh, the voltage across that. And as you can see, it started with a, a negative on the, on the untyped side, and then they go larger and larger. The reason they become larger and larger is because you go, go into the depletion region of your, of your period junction. So your carrier concentration is reduced. And, and as, as I show you that the carrier concentration reduced, your Seebeck coefficient will just, just boost up. And, and after that, you will just go into the PTAP region. Here is you, you also have a peak right here. And then, and then your voltage become positive. So wow, this is, uh, this is pretty exciting that uh, we really have a nanometer resolution of a Seebeck coefficient measure. OK, this is good. So let's go to some really like a nanostructure material that see if we can, we can get something interesting, see if we can see the quantum confinement enhance the, the Seebeck coefficient or something like that. So here is one of the samples that we provide by our collaborator. So what they do is like uh, they grow uh, Antony telluride, which is some kind of a good uh, thermoelectric material. And then they use a special technique. They use uh, like a fentanyl laser to shine onto the surface. And then after, it, after the surface uh, being shined with this uh, fentanyl laser, it can generate some kind of a, a nanostructure, the nano track, as you can see right here. So you just, you just uh, scan, scan the surface with uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the laser, and then you can generate this uh, this kind of track. And the, the direction of this track will be related to the polarization of your laser. So this is one way you can generate kind of like a nanostructure inside uh, in, inside some kind of the, uh, thermoelectric material. The detail of uh, the mechanism like uh, still like uh, under debate. So we don't really know what's going on, but uh, somehow it can generate thermoelectric uh, good thermoelectric material. And but the question is. You shine it with a laser, so it's very hot. It actually, it's, it will go like high temperature. So nobody really know what is the material right here right now. So what we did is like we use uh, our our like scanning thermoelectric microscopy to scan like across the material right here, and then we find out that inside that region, inside the shine region, which is, and then also the the, the thermoelectric effect actually is the same and inside and outside is the same. So it's kind of good and kind of bad. Kind of bad is because we don't see like an enhancement of a uh, of, uh, Seebeck coefficient. The kind of good is like, all right, actually, the things that inside right here still have, we still have a, a anti uh, antimony telegraph inside. It's not like being changed a lot. But actually, uh, there's another, so, and then we do some other characterization. What we found is like the, the the, the method is uh, called scanning tunneling microscopy. So this is a technique of uh, STM. This can be used to mapping all the density states inside inside your material. And then so the line that, that I draw right here is uh, this is uh, corresponding to your density states. And then and then once you you drop to zero, actually this means that you go into the band. That you you you're going to the band gap. So inside the uh, outside the material, the band gap is small. But somehow go into the inside the material, the bank gap is large. And so somehow it's not consistent with this result because somehow it's showing that oh it becomes more insulating inside inside those regions that have been shined with the phantom laser. 
but outside, uh, but outside it's a uh, it's more metallic like. So what we propose is like uh, actually when we do this uh, scanning thermal electric microscopy, is you kind of like poke through into the into the material. So you probe the material inside, and then but the surface, uh, but the this uh, scanning thermal electric microscopy, you you scanning the surface. So what we found is like uh, the material that uh, the this uh, this nanostructure actually is something that you have. Uh, you have something. Uh, you have a thermal electric. Uh, you have antimony telluride inside, and it's covered with some kind of insulator outside. And actually, this being confirmed by uh, later, we do like a T. Uh, our collaborator did a TEM cross section view. So you see here inside, it's the antimony telluride, and outside there are some kind of strange uh, material that generated over there, and then those are insulator. And so, I mean, our method it's really good at confirming actually these are even even with, uh, with, with even with the TEM actually you don't really know what they are but with our method we confirm that these are the antimony terra because they have the same state by coefficient as our sun and then we confirm that these are insulator because uh, the, the uh, scanning tunnel and microscopy showing that these are have a large vacuum cap and so so this is a this this is pretty good I mean we use it you use it to um, to characterize the uh, uh, um, um, the property of your of your nanostructure material, and so in the in the future, if if they can reduce the size of these uh, these antimony terabyte, maybe we can get re real uh, uh, nanowire and really enhance the semi coefficient. So next is uh, another application, which is uh, then we use it to scan through a quantum dot, a single quantum dot. So here I, we, we plotted that we, we use uh, MBE to grow the quantum dot, which is uh, indium arsenide on top of uh, gallium, uh, gallium arsenide. So those are white. This is an AFM scan, and then those white dots are the uh, uh, indium arsenide quantum dot, and the substrate is uh, gallium. Uh, it's a gallium arsenide. So we just uh, use uh, this uh, method to use a scanning thermal uh, thermal electric microscopy to scan across this material and then we measure, we see that the voltage actually uh, change a lot and then we see it's negative because it's untapped doping and then on, on the boundary of uh, this material you have a really large uh, thermal voltage which means that you have a large feedback coefficient and actually these are, uh, we, we found that actually these correspond to the, to the also the depletion zone across uh, two different material and because I said that the CIVAC coefficient is strongly related to the chemical concentration. So actually we can use the CIVAC coefficient and then convert it to a carrier concentration profile across a single quantum dot. Actually this haven't been... If you think about it, how are you going to measure free carrier concentration? The most uh, easy way is using uh, Hall effect. But how can you measure Hall effect across a single quantum dot? It's, it's almost impossible. So this method provides a really like a good um, a, a good approach that you can you can profile the uh, the free carrier concentration across some kind of nanostructure. So here we found that this uh, indium mosonite common dot actually they have a small like a lower carrier free carrier concentration compared to compared to the gallium mosonite. Even even though when we grow this we 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 kind of uh, trying to grow them with. Uh, with the with the same carrier concentration, um, but uh, uh, there are some mechanisms so that actually the do the dopant cannot really go into the common dot, which is uh, also kind of interesting. So this method for determining the carrier concentration yep. from the photothermoelectric signal. Yep. How does this compare with what you get with Hall measurements? Have you done the comparison? Uh, so Hall measurement is also kind of like a, a bulk measurement, right? Mm -hmm. So what you can measure actually. Uh, I mean, we, the, there was some measurement data on this sample, but actually it's all measuring the gallium arsenide, not really the quantum dot. I mean, you can you cannot you cannot really directly. Uh, I mean, so so so. I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, so, so I'll follow this here after the talk. It's an interesting approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, other than that, actually, there is more uh, profound uh, uh, progress on this uh, method. Which is um, not not that by us, by other group. So they modified an AFM 
and then so use AFM to characterize the Seebeck coefficient or for the actually the thermal voltage across a, a, a like on the surface of a, of a architectural growth uh, graphene. And so this is the topography. So they use AFM scan. This is the topography of, of, of their graphene. And then this is the same uh, area of uh, of here, but this is the thermal voltage. And as you can see, there are uh, a lot of uh, a strange pattern right here. And so what they found is that this pattern actually also related to the um, to the density of states. And then what they found is that because of the orientation of uh, those pieces are, uh, are are misaligned. So along along those uh, um, and then so so their density of states are different from from all the other area. So actually this becomes a new method that you can you can see uh, defects. Of, uh, of 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 some kind of material that we grow, and then so 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 this is also kind of exciting, and then also you can see that this is the voltage. You have negative and positive. They also found some area that they intentionally do like untapped doping, but uh, you got some kind of TP that doping in some area. So this is this is also um, yeah, this is also something new. You see this. Spatial resolution based on the mean free path for the of photons. Yeah. So what are typical values? It uh, depends on different material. In yeah. semi, yeah. What in are you doing here for the quantum dots, for example? For quantum dots, it can uh, the material that we grow uh, that, that we have is about like a few few nanometer. Seven actually, uh, our estimation is about like seven nanometer. And then graphene actually, um, it's a very good thermal conductor, um, so it could be higher. Yeah. So, for example, um, if you have higher, like a uh, uh, phonon mean free path, actually, the area that is, like uh, generates the temperature gradient is larger. So, actually, um, your image will become like blurry. Yeah. So, but this is uh, something um, that never been proved before. Okay. So let me conclude my talk. So I hope I convinced you that the nanostructure material. Um, could potentially improve the efficiency of uh, thermoelectric uh, conversion and, uh, conversion uh, efficiency. And second is like we do really need the suitable uh, characterization such as like scan, scanning thermoelectric mic microscopy to explore those uh, nano, uh, nanostructure thermoelectric material to improve uh, to, to improve uh, the thermoelectric property. And the end is like uh, I also showing you that the scanning thermoelectric microscopy being used to become a new characterized tool. For example, you can characterize the free carrier, the, uh, the free carrier concentration, or uh, detecting some kind of defects that have never been shown uh, in, in other kind of characterized tool. So with that, I'll thank you, and I'll take you uh, some questions. But that's just technical issue. Yes, okay. for for this for for this kind of technique, as long, you can cool down your sample. You can cool down your sample, and as long as you can generate a temperature gradient between your tip and your sample, it's fine. So yes, you can do this. You can you can actually measure the Hall effect at the same time when you measure when you when you when you do this scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I well, just kind of actually going off of that rule. Would be really cool is in these setups you were you were heating the sample. Mm -hmm. You could also get heat, cool the same side and see that you got the negative voltage to prove that you're seeing this effect, right? Because it works reverse. Cool yeah. it versus heat. Yeah. So I don't know. It would be cool to see both effects. Then you could just put your sample on like this cryostat thing and 
would be really easy to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. English is yeah, um, so I think I have this one. Oh, this is just different type of material. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 you're yeah. right. You're right. Actually, it, it, it will be a kind of like a um, good uh, test experiment. That yeah. you, can, you, can, you can even reverse it and make sure that what you measure right. is correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, but I'm just thinking you can do it on the same area. Yeah. You know, and you can see how that affects. Okay, yeah. cool. And to do, and to do, uh, do measurements like this on regular kind of bulk materials and mm -hmm. compare it with the like Hall effect? Did you guys ever do any comparisons to test, uh, for example, carrier concentrations, exactly how closely you and, um, your results match those? Yeah, so so the result is like, a, oh, you mean the outside? Like, a, for example, for this one, right? Uh, no, 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 something that you can do all on. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, actually, we do we do whole effect. I mean, I think we did the whole effect on this one. So what we got is we got this one, which is the... Uh, the whole effect gives us a carrier concentration right here, which is the which is the the, the background, which is the gamma the substrate. Yeah. yeah, it's the substrate. So the contribution, like uh, from those corner dots, are too small, so you, you cannot really detect it. So this is a really good good tool that you can see something happen really local, and and then it, it's really hard to probe with this with these kind of uh, fault there. You can get three D maps so of these uh, measurements? Unfortunately, right, yeah, right now, no, because uh, we are, so this is, uh, so this um, uh, method, it's a, it's a modified either STM or AFM. So because you need to have a tip to contact your surface on the surface of your sample. Okay. So basically, you can only do like a surface measure. In the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're just scanning, you can, if you use AFM, then you can scan in the surface and then you, you get it. But like if you want to go deeper, uh, you need to drill. Drill that's this. Right, yeah. yeah, so that's uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Alright, uh, another round of applause for our speaker.